you're bringing on hell and fury. Okay, right, let's get going, people. Um, we haven't had an asset capitalist show for a while. Uh, my sincere apologies. Uh, my life continues uh, to be something of a caper. Um, I have been on the road now for um, two and a half months. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in the mountains. I'm now on my own. Um, and I've had mountain flu. Uh, you may hear me cough and splutter through this, but I assure you it will not come through uh, the Wi-Fi uh, to, to a sofa near you. Uh, but this week, this, this is another one of these you know, great, great, great weeks because we have um, Brad, Brad Setzer. Um, we have a, a senior fellow of the Council of Foreign Relations. Oh, my God, you know. Uh, Brad, thank you so much uh, for agreeing to spend some time um, in the world of asset capitalism. It's going to be an adventure. Thanks so much for inviting me. Well, more than adventure, I, I'm hoping to, to learn a lot. I think um, the regular viewers, regular listeners uh, will, will have heard my misgivings, perhaps about uh, where we are in the economic cycle, um, the notion of this, this inflation, the supply shocks. We, we live in uh, maybe one always says says that we live in unprecedented times, but uh, the um, the compass points are really kind of jarring at this point. And 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 I have a thesis that I'm hoping that Brad's going to bring his great intellect to. Um, I guess that my principal notion is that the the world of economics, but perhaps more specifically, the the world of global macro management profoundly changed um at the the turn of the turn of the centuries the turn of the centuries there was a uh, there was a crisis in asia the tiger crisis no that's not a tiger hedge fund that's reference to uh, the incredibly dynamic economic performance of of economies such as thailand um, the the astonishing model of south korea brad i, I think i'm right in saying that south korea which of course came from abject poverty and and is and now has um, per capita income on on a par with with Western powers, and, and it got there every year by recording um, a trade deficit. Am I right in saying trade trade deficit? Yeah, uh, because yeah, it, it, until it, Korea until, ran trade deficits for a while. I mean, they weren't huge, but they did. Yeah, run. but for the longest and kind of consistent time, and and because and why and why and why because the return on domestic investment beat anything that they could get investing overseas, one one would imagine. But um, that all came crashing down and we had currencies devalue greatly and sovereign leaders were um, hurried out of office, let's say. And, and that acted as a precedent um, with the pivot of China becoming very central um, to the world at large. And I think Chinese leaders looked at it and they thought, mm, that's really not for us. And so I feel like the world of the Charles Kindleberger, um, his his great classic book, um, Manius, Manius what, what is the book called? I, you know, I know more of it in spirit and I, I know the chapter headings rather than the title. Um, but that was a, a sure safe way to trade currencies, especially in the emerging markets um, and other interventions. And Bubbles, Manias and Panics, I'm sure that's the name. Mm -hmm. um, and it just hasn't worked. And, and I want to say central banking kind of hasn't worked either. I mean, you know, tell me the last, tell me the last intervention of the Federal Reserve where you thought, Gee, the, these guys really kind of pulled a rabbit out. I mean, if I'm generous, I guess I could say uh, March 2009, you know, with the uh, with the the gambit of quantitative easing. Now, what quantitative easing is, I don't want to go into that territory. Uh, but in terms of pyrotechnics, in terms of changing risk behavior and assessment, um, I think it, it made the difference between having a very overt, I'm going to use this word, depression, 
to having perhaps a silent depression, which is what I described the last 15 years. Anyway, I, I think uh, China is very much China and, and other sovereigns and how they manage their trade behavior um, is, is very much um, a, a greater source to understanding asset prices today. And so that's why I'm speaking too much because I'm too excited because, you know, I, I I read your work on Twitter. I think it's a fantastic resource. In fact, I was all over it today. I thought you had a, a, a great thread out there. Um, again, this de-dollarization rhetoric and, and madness. And, and so um, the opportunity to have, to have a say in a voice. So I'm going to stop speaking, but just, just, just say anything, anything. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think Asia, the Asian crisis of 97, 98 was uh, one of two big pivot points. I'm not sure. Um, I think there was a separate pivot point when China followed the dollar down and the dollar's course changed in 23 or 2003. Um, so I, I view it as sort of more of a two-stage two stage adjustment. Uh, but there's, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, the recognition in Asia that they were vulnerable to like old fashioned bank run style dynamics. If you had too much short term external debt relative to your reserves, fundamentally changed uh, central banks behavior. And most Asian countries decided that it's much easier to manage your currency if you're running a current account surplus and you're resisting appreciation. Um, I think China actually came to that. I think China had that realization during the Asia crisis. I think the fall of Suharto clearly had a huge impact on China's leadership and on their attitude towards taking on external debt and their willingness to, to run sort of external balance sheet risk. But you don't really see the huge acceleration in Chinese reserve growth until the dollar peaks in, I think, 02 and starts to turn down. Remember that during the Asia crisis, China held on to the dollar peg and China's currency wasn't obviously undervalued. That obvious undervaluation emerges in 03 very quickly when it becomes clear that uh, China's accession to the WTO was a much bigger positive shock to China's economy than anyone realized. There was a much bigger shift in production towards China. Um, and then when the dollar changes course in 03 and starts to go down and China follows the dollar down when there's this huge positive shock to China's trade. And to me, that's kind of one of the original sins that gives rise to some of the tensions within globalization. If the yuan had been allowed to appreciate then uh, and China hadn't built up an, a huge war chest of reserves at the time, hadn't... Uh, started running a 10% of GDP current account surplus. I mean, that took a couple of years. If uh, China didn't have so many reserves by 2005 and 2006 that it was hiding its reserves from the world by shifting to the state banks, I think we'd be in a little bit of a different world today. We maybe would have had a more balanced uh, economic uh, evolution over the past 20 years. So I think it's, a, it's it, it was a huge shock. It still it reverberates. And then I think there have been a series of subsequent decisions that kind of reinforce that pivot. Let's try just put some some numbers on it. You know, some of the, the folk listening perhaps wouldn't be too aware of the the vagaries of the the one the Remimbi uh, dollar rate. Um, I have in my mind. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, one of the I always like to think of the starting point being as early as 1994. And I say 1994 with the NAFTA agreement. And I think if I'm right, the the, the Chinese authorities um, revalued lower the currency. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to say to nine, is that correct? I think it was like 8.2, if I remember. Like 8.2 was the longstanding uh, rate. It, technically, it was, it was a unification of multiple exchange rates, uh, but it did have the effect of... Uh, of devaluing uh, the yuan. And it kind of left the yuan a little bit undervalued relative to the rest of Asia, which was losing competitiveness, which was one of, in my views, the hidden causes of the Asian crisis. And then every all of Asia, except China, adjusted down against the dollar and the crisis. And then for a brief period of time, you can say that China wasn't undervalued, maybe it was fairly valued. 
Um, and then I think that swung pretty quickly uh, back to an undervalued position uh, without moving against the dollar. It was just, you know, how everything else around China moved and then how the dollar moved. I mean, the dollar was exceptionally strong. People forget in, in, um, at the turn of the millennium in 2000, 2001, even when the U.S. was in a recession, uh, the post 9-11 period, there was such dollar strength in that downturn that I think that contributed to some of the deindustrialization of the uh, U.S. economy. You, know, you kind of combine dollar strength, WTO accession, China's entry into the like a stable global trading relationship, and essentially when um, U.S. electronics manufacturing kind of contracted massively after the dot com crisis, uh, all that uh, at that time, all that capacity migrated to Asia and to China um, with very clear effects. So um, I do think that was a very uh, important era. But then, you know, China stayed at, at 8.2 up until 2005, even when the dollar really started to go down. And by 2005, I, there was one of the, it was just a massive undervaluation relative to China's improved fundamentals. China starts posting, Current account surpluses of five, six, seven, eight percent of GDP, reserve growth of ten percent of GDP. These are for a big economy, and China had suddenly become a big economy. Those are big numbers. I mean, the I, one number that I think is useful to remember is that at in two thousand, at the turn of the century, China was a one trillion dollar economy, and the U.S. was a ten trillion dollar economy. By the time of the global financial crisis, China was a four trillion dollar economy. Now China is a 16, 17, 18 billion trillion sorry, dollar economy. Um, and you know, the US has gone from 10 to 25. So there's been a China has gone from being like way smaller than Europe to being, you know, as big as the EU. Um I mean one could that's, say that's a huge swing. Yeah, it is a huge swing swing. Um of, of course, I, I wonder if you can quote the comparable wealth levels for China vis-a-vis -vis the US, because, you know, I would certainly contend that when when the input, when, when GDP growth is the input to the model, um, that you, you can generate whatever GDP, but typically, uh, certainly when you get to the extreme, it, it's very much at the expense of wealth, um, but a, a moot point perhaps, well, more, well a, a footnote. Um, I, I, you said many things there, I'm going to take a kind of intermission um, to preserve my sanity because we're recording this on, on Tuesday. And to my great shock, to my great horror, um, the god of macro, Stanley Druckenmiller, um, it, 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 it leaked out that the day before he'd been addressing the large state uh, sovereign wealth fund in Norway. And the Stan, Stan the man, is now short the US dollar. Uh, he's profoundly bearish on the prognosis for the US economy. Uh, but he he believes that when, again, we keep using this terrible word pivot, but when the, the Fed eventually has no choice but to slam rates back to the floor, that the dollar will, will weaken. And I think you did say, you, you mentioned the, uh, not just the robustness, but the strength of the dollar. Uh, uh, at the turn of the century, which of course coincided with the collapse of the Nasdaq bubble, and we had a very, very severe contraction in in the economy, and, and of course I think rates fell from the best part of six to like one and a quarter percent, and yet the dollar stand, the dollar actually appreciated. So anyway, I'm going to close that window. I just, you know, it it, it pains me to hear Stan uh, uh, saying these things. Um, Eight point two. NAFTA agreement. Um, where's the car? I know this answer. Where, 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 where is that? Where's that pair trading today? Uh, CNY is about a little like around seven. Let's call it seven. Yeah. Okay. Eight, so nineteen nine. So thirty years. <laughs> best part of thirty years. Seven. Uh, Eight point two to to seven. And when you. You know, when you look at the, you know as a as a trader kind of you know this preposterous game of trying to guess the future, but um, you kind of think like it's going to hang around north of seven or we should say uh, remember weakness. Um, that is profound undervaluation. Yeah, 
I mean, how, how does one begin to determine uh, were it not for various central banking interventions where that, that cross would trade? I mean, I, I honestly think that's uh, an impossible question to answer and not a relevant question because China doesn't have a, an open financial account. Uh, this, the PBOC doesn't run a standard monetary policy that relies entirely on rates. It still uses quantitative measures, directed lending. Um, and, you know, the the, the Fed uh, uh, does rely primarily on rates as its main policy tool. I mean, quantitative easing supplements that as a balance sheet tool. But I, I don't think you can imagine where the CNY would be um, without China's controls and without the the broader infrastructure that the PBOC brings to managing the exchange rate. That said, you can look at uh, what CNY at seven means for global trade. Um, and, you know, my basic rule of thumb is as follows. If the, the yuan is appreciating in real terms, so not just against the dollar, but in broad terms, China's trade tends to grow with the global, or its exports tend to grow with the global economy. When China depreciates a bit in real terms, uh, China's trade tends to outperform the global economy. So from so like 2002 for several years on China was wild Chinese export growth was wildly outperforming the global economy which was a pretty clear sign of trade undervaluation there was a brief period of time when the yuan moved from from 82 to you know first like uh 6 8 during the crisis and then up towards 6 and the dollar also appreciated and that had did actually slow China's export growth so it was growing in line with global imports. But after China kind of uh, shifted, had to depreciate a bit against the dollar in, uh, in 15, and there was a couple of years lag, uh, China's moved to a position where in my view it is undervalued relative to China's trade strength. By that, I mean China's gaining global export market share, exports volume, outperform global import volume. And one thing I think people just don't pay attention to, particularly in the U.S., is just how strong China's exports have been. I mean, they've gone up by a trillion dollars relative to pre-COVID by a percentage point of world GDP. That is even with the Trump tariffs. So like China is just a massive export powerhouse right now. And to me, it is undervalued in trade terms. The size of the reported current account for really weird technical reasons is uh, is smaller than the true trade surplus. Um, and, uh, you know, China's export machine is just humming, humming, humming along. I mean, the, those, those ratios, um, the, tr the trade surplus to GDP, um, the trade surplus to global GDP. Am I, am I, I think I read uh, Michael Pettis saying it, we were around about one and a half percent. Where where's the, the surplus? So global GDP is a hundred trillion dollars. Mm. So like the the good surplus is about one percent of world GDP now. Um, if you look at the manufacturing surplus, which is what impacts a lot of work. I mean, China just structurally exports manufacturers, imports commodities, um, but it does so on such a massive scale that it impacts both sides of the ledger. The manufacturing surplus is now close to 2% of world GDP, and Chinese exports in total are like 4.5% of world GDP. So the ratio between China's manufacturing surplus and its manufacturing exports is enormous. China exports a ton of manufacturers. It doesn't import very many manufacturers. And Chinese import growth has, over the past 20 years, uh, tended to lag China's GDP growth, which is a slightly unusual outcome. Um, so that's kind of the uh, the structural gap, which leads to China putting pressure on manufacturing globally over globally. the past twenty years. Can 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 you give us a um, historical kind of reference point for those those ratios? You you were saying manufacturing uh, surplus two percent of global GDP. What was the four you said? The four and a half is uh, China's manufacturing exports relative to world GDP. It's a good question. Um, 
I, I don't immediately know the answer, but it is a it is a good question. Um, I, think I don't think I don't think anything has been that big in post uh, World War II history. I mean, the U.S. current account deficit wasn't like didn't get to the fours and fives until you know two thousand four two thousand five. Um, you know, during the the German and Japan surplus era, like overall trade was tended to be a little smaller, and uh, the magnitude of both surpluses and deficits was a bit smaller. Not that they weren't significant, but I think I think the scale. I, I at least don't. I mean, these numbers have changed. Um, so, like one of the difficulties about talking about China is that any number measured relative to China's GDP tends to tends to has been shrinking a bit. So the Chinese current account surplus peaked at 10% of China's GDP in 07, partially because the exchange rate was so undervalued. So you measure it relative to dollar GDP. I think China has been man massaging the current account surplus, but that's come down to two and three percent of GDP. But if you measure that as a share of world GDP, it is uh basically at the same level, which is a just a massive uh uh, it just has massive impacts on uh, trade flows globally, capital flows globally. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes me think to to reach out and look at where U.S. surpluses traded in the 1920s. Um, and I think that's actually a very relevant benchmark. Uh, your, your friend Michael Pettis probably has looked at that. Uh, I, I'd, 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 I'd see if you, uh, he probably has an immediate answer on that one. Well, I mean, I've got this friend called... Well, I was going to say Google, but I don't use Google. Um, I use one of these kind of dark or more obscure uh, portals, but uh, I'm, I'm sure they will have an answer. The, um, but, you know, my, my, my understanding of economics is, is the examination of uh, disequilibrium and then what happens to restore uh, society to some notion of uh, mean reversion. And um, we, we now really have to use the word, uh, I was going to say persistent. It, it seems perhaps you could replace persistent with perpetual surpluses being recorded uh, but by the Chinese model. Um, and at the same time, so the, the conundrum of, of this century, um, Ben Bernanke gave it, gave it the name of the, you know, the, the surplus savings, the glut, the glut mm. savings, um, seems to be very much related to this behavior. You know, a China that exports a great deal, but doesn't bring it back in. And, and when I, when we mentioned the twenties, um, you had a gold standard, and you had a mean, which was essentially a means for governing the behavior of sovereign nations when when they when they overlapped with regard to trade. Yeah, and so a, a country running persistent uh, surpluses would be the recipient um, of of gold inflows, which if I'm right in saying would if the idea or the logic would be that, that that would represent high powered money being injected into the private banking system, which would accelerate domestic economic growth and domestic wealth. And the idea being that that would therefore create domestic demand, which would boost imports from the surplus nation. And you would have the restoration of equilibrium. And, and my faint understanding of that time is that the New York Fed, looking at an economy which it thought was too strong, regardless of any exogenous factors such as this overseas gold, it actually sterilized. And therefore, we never got the process of mean re reversion. And, and therefore, the system just broke. And so I fear, I'm saying again too much, but I fear there should be great shock and horror with the persistency of the surplus because it's telling us that economics isn't working. And if economics doesn't work, it eventually breaks with devastating consequences. Have you, have you thought about it in those terms? A bit. I mean, I, I mean, the interesting thing about the 20s, if I remember my history right, is that um, I think you're right that the New York Fed sterilized, but uh, the Akadamids, Lords of Finance, is just brilliant. So it's uh, there's an easy source and it's better than Google. 
Um, but then remember that there's also deflationary pressure on the country that's losing gold. Um, and that deflationary pressure is the other mechanism of adjustment. So that has always been the concern about the operation of the classic gold standard is that, you know, a country that has deficits is losing gold and it only adjusts. A lot of the pressure to adjust is on the deflation on that side. And then in the 20s, the U.S. was actually recycling its surplus back to Germany, which had to make a lot of payments after uh, the reparations and so forth from World War One. So we were in a little bit uh, the China role. Um, and I think when that reparation, when the U.S. recycling broke down, that contributed to a lot of the, the chaos. Um, but your bigger point is an important one, which is that deficits and surpluses have been remarkably persistent. Um, China's been structurally in surplus for forever. Taiwan to Singapore. Uh, you know, the, the oil exporters, ironically, have had a little bit more volatility just because some of them uh, have pretty high break evens and they run deficits when oil falls below a certain level. But Asia has been just in Asia x Japan. And Japan's a bit different because its current account surplus is now almost entirely from investment income. It's not actually a trade surplus, but set that aside. You know, the, the Koreas, the Taiwans, the Chinas, the Singapores have just been structurally in surplus. And the U.S. has been structurally in deficit for a really uh, long period. Um, the U.S. Net, uh, net external debt is actually quite big, 50% of GDP. It's in our own currency. It's broadly stable if U.S. growth is higher than U.S. interest rates and if the trade deficit isn't too big. But it's a, it is big, absolutely. And uh, Asia's savings surplus is big. I mean, the reason why China has been structurally in a current account surplus is simple. China saves more than any uh, country should. It's been saving over 40% of GDP for the past 25 years. For a while, it was saving close to 50% of GDP. You know, Norway saves that much by recycling all of its oil surplus into the sovereign fund when oil prices are high. The private sector never touches it. Singapore saves that much by recycling all of the uh, its sovereign wealth fund, the GIC's income, back into the GIC and just building up assets in a perpetual loop, and the population doesn't touch it. China doesn't quite do the same thing. It just saves a ton. Um, it has weirdly, China doesn't collect any income tax, like 1% of GDP, really tiny relative to the rest of the world, doesn't collect any property tax, doesn't have a big social safety net, has enormous precautionary savings. And this generates enormous distortions globally. Countries that invest as much as China should run current account deficits. And I think the risk going forward is when China was booming, it still ran a current account surplus because of the super high savings rate. And if, when investment comes down, China can continue to run big current account surpluses. And that's just like 40, 50 years of big surpluses is a big deal. Um, same thing for the U.S. I mean, we, we, we're, we feel the effects of persistent deficits. In my view, in the, the sense that the U.S. doesn't manufacture as much as it should, doesn't export as much as it should uh, it, for real goods. Obviously, the U.S. sells a lot of debt to the world. And that, that has created a sense of vulnerability here that I think is real and important. Yeah, it's kind of chicken and egg, isn't it, in terms of trying to determine the source? I mean, I, I certainly fell for it a little bit that the, the saving sounds very noble. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, the, the, and, and, and then we affix silly cultural prejudices and, and the like to these things as well. Um, I think I think one could scrape away at it and and say that the um, there's nothing noble about the high savings ratio in in China, and that it's again it's it's fostering a system where economics um, no longer moves that you know you just get persistencies uh, you get perpetual um, it, direction from two different agents and eventually that the thing. It's, it's, it's pulled apart, but you know, the, it would seem, you know, again, we, we, we introed with um, the level of the currency. Yeah. And you know, we, we spoke about how, if you will, if I'm a Chinese citizen and I have brought 
great endeavor and I've, I've moved my family from the provinces. I'm in these incredible metropolises. I'm working hard, et cetera. I'm educating myself. Um, and with all of the early infrastructure investments, I mean, they truly have built centers of excellence. You know? And productivity has surged beyond imagination from profoundly low levels to, you know, to, um, to where they are today. Um, my understanding is economics would reward those citizens with wealth, wealth vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, that um, being able to purchase something manufactured, either a good or a service in the United States or in Europe, would be considerably cheaper to a Chinese citizen. But if the currency, when you consider the 30-year the arc of that, of that incredible industrial uh, progress, gives you 8.2 to 7, then boom, you know, you, you are defunding a, a profound source of aggregate demand. And as a policymaker that's very concerned about, again, the persistency of their, of their ownership of the political system, they don't want to put wealth in the hands of a household sector because it creates the vicissitudes that we know well of an economic cycle. I mean, I think we're in the throes of an economic cycle in, in the domestic US. I think we're going to have quite a sharp uh, contraction. Chinese, again, have, have linear progressions. And Maybe we, not. I mean, I, I think the, the, the economic cycle in China is just is so driven by investment cycles. Um, because household demand is such a weak contributor to Chinese growth, we don't. It doesn't have the same cycles as we have in the U.S. Uh, but there, there have been, in my view, uh, a series of of booms and busts after 08 and 09 in China that that have been smoothed in the official data. Um, but I do think there's actually been a certain amount of volatility in China's growth. There has been a cycle. Uh, China actually has been going through a down cycle, which is part of the reason why its exports are so strong. Uh, it's part of the reason why its imports have been pretty weak. Um, so, I, you know, th there is a cycle, uh, but your bigger point is an important one, which is that um, China China's population is poorer than it should be. It doesn't uh, have the external purchasing power it should have. Uh, low you know, migrant workers who move into urban China, who work in the factories, aren't paid as much as they should be inside China. They pay actually quite, I mean, not necessarily if they're an informal migrant worker, but the formal, any worker who enters the formal urban workforce at the low end actually pays an enormous social security contribution for pretty miserable benefits just because it's a lump sum payment into the system. So it doesn't vary as your income goes up very much. Yeah, there's just a big buy-in that weighs really heavily on low wage work. So- You've got a sales tax as well, yeah, which again is regressive. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, an, a regressive version of a social security of the US payroll tax, plus a big uh, VAT, a consumption tax and almost no taxation of capital income, of property, uh, of, of income. I mean, 1% of GDP in income tax collection, personal income tax is tiny. The U.S. collects eight. Um, it's just, it is a strange society. We think of it as this like overarching state-run uh, society, which in some ways is true. Like the state capitalist part of China is real. Um, there, there are big state companies that control big parts of the economy. The big state commercial banks control the bulk of the banking system. China's uh, financial account recycling is done through the state commercial banks, the policy bank, and the PBOC. The state is a huge presence, uh, but the state is actually in China doesn't provide very significant or uh, meaningful uh, benefits. The healthcare system benefits are 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 not that strong and there's a big they're big what we would call co-payments um and you, you know sometimes you have to pay the cost up front and then get reimbursed you don't you know medicare just doesn't pick up the tab after a co-payment so there, there's just a bunch of ways in which chinese citizens uh are poorer than they should be given the productivity of china's economy and you see that productivity in the export data you don't see it in the 
the most many measures of of well being. You know, all that said, you know, of course, China China is way even low income. The low income part of the population in China is way better off than they were 25 years ago. That's just a fact. It's just a relatively they could be much better off. And that hasn't happened. The other interesting case, which fits your thesis about the lack of movement in currency, is Taiwan, which you know politically there's a huge divide. But the Taiwan dollar uh, is weaker today than it was in 1997, uh, and Taiwan is now at the cutting, absolute cutting edge of technological development in the semiconductor sector. But that doesn't show up in the exchange rate. It just has showed up in a massive current account surplus, way bigger than China's as a share of GDP. So I think there's a general point there that a lot of these export-driven economies have not allowed living standards to go up in a way that their, their productivity and this technological advance of their uh, economic systems would allow. And it's a real problem. And that... Um, that in essence, is the, the break with the, the previous development model up until the Asian tiger crisis in 97, 98, yeah? Uh, for, for a subset of Asian economies. I mean, there are, you know, I, I, it doesn't fit that well for Latin America as a, oh, sure. as a you know, it's just, uh, but within Asia, yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, in a, you know, what I've said is that Taiwan never recovered from the Asia financial crisis, which is a bit of a an ironic thing because China wasn't Taiwan wasn't at the epicenter of the Asian financial crisis. It didn't have uh, excess short term borrowing. But tai Taiwan is 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 just a a wonderful example from. I'm I'm so glad you mentioned that because they they devalued in '98. Yeah, I mean they. Mm -hmm were super competitive they had a trade surplus and then they went you know what guys <laughs> we're yep. taking currency down it's like the aesop's uh, fable you know it's the scorpion takes the frog out midstream and the frog is like why did you do that it's like <laughs> i was born that way you know it's like a, a mercantilist nation can never let go of Everyone else is devouring. You bet we're devouring. So again, there's a concern. And, and it was, I think it's also that you know Taiwan didn't want their currency to appreciate uh, relative to China. So like they, in order to maintain their manufacturing competitiveness relative to their neighbor the next door, they've maintained an undervaluation not against the not only against the U.S. dollar, but in many ways against the yuan. And there, there's a capital flows component, which is you know I've been fascinated with for a long time. You know. Taiwan intervened really heavily. Uh, then it hit its intervention, uh, didn't report its forward book, which was just like a bunch of swaps with the Taiwanese lifers. It regulates the lifers in a way that allows the life insurance sector to build up this massive uh, open position where they're uh, holding dollar assets against Taiwan dollar liabilities. They actually... Um, have the opposite financial risks of a typical emerging market. A typical emerging market borrows in dollars and gets clobbered if their currency depreciates against the dollar. Taiwan's financial sector benefits when the Taiwan dollar falls, and it would be really hit hard if the Taiwan dollar were allowed to appreciate against the dollar. Of course, you know the CB, the central bank steps in to limit that, but it is just fundamentally uh, different and interesting. Um, but I think there's a general trend there, which is that a set of countries in Asia not only built up massive reserves, but they built up so many reserves that they didn't want to report them all to the world. And they found ways to move them off the central bank's balance sheet and to hide the scale of their asset accumulation. Taiwan's a clean case. They've come clean. Or they've, they've admitted they had this big forward book several years ago. They now disclose it fairly regularly. They should do it more regularly. But I don't think China's actually yet come clean. I think China's hiding some of its reserves, which is one of my more controversial views. But um, yeah, I have but, a lot of confidence in it. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that. Um, um, I, I worry that with my with the, the flu still hanging over me. I, I did say, uh, I was referring to China, one of the, I believe one of the principal tax raising mechanisms is what we call in Europe a, a, a VAT, a value added or a sales. Mm. 
incomes. And I, I was saying that it's kind of regressive because it's a fixed rate independent of, of incomes. Um, but I mean, there you are as you know, a fellow, a fellow of the Council of Foreign Relations. Um, and, and and unfortunately, we, we live at a time where uh, trade disputes and tariffs and and, and we live in a, 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 a you know, we, uh, politics, the radicalization um, domestically in the U.S., um, yeah, and you, you could be called upon as a, as a wise man. You know what what is going on in China? You know because um, China shows no interest in really changing the nature of its distribution of social security and, and payments and the like. Um, it seems that it seems very hard to imagine that that currency. Um, would would appreciate even back to the levels of of six, if not below that, and so the future seems to be one of again persistent trade surpluses. The future seems to be one where the United States is essentially the recipient of of the world's global savings, which would make sense if we were in the nineteenth century, and um, the overseas, uh, the the domestic investment needs were massive versus the domestic savings in America, but as you know, that that's not the case. And so, one could also claim that this beast has left untamed what it seems to have done. You know, I, I look upon the reserves and the management of the reserves and the preponderance of of dollar assets. You've essentially thrown Mount Everest, or maybe I should say um, Mont Blanc, mm -hmm. thrown it into the into Lake Geneva in terms of <laughs> liquidity. I mean, people talk about the phantom of quantitative easing. I I'm very much of the belief that banking reserves are inert. Uh, they're a, a, a bogeyman which can um, prompt discussion of all with regard to the mechanisms of the Federal Reserve. But really, if we're talking about an avalanche of liquidity, it would seem to be coming from the overseas sector. And as a result, I, I want to say that we've almost destroyed the ability of, of money, that money, the price of money, which is meant to be the fulcrum point between debtors and creditors, you know, allowing them to come together, converge and, and transact and invest and build wealth. That we've we've destroyed that, and, and it seems that the United States, in particular, um, has become not an entrepreneurial society, but a speculative society. I mean, if if a kid asks, it breaks my heart. If a kid comes to a smart kid comes to me today and says, "What should I do?" I said, "You have to be rent seeking around Wall Street." Yeah. So, as a wise man, because I. I I don't see wisdom from policy advisors to to United States po uh, politicians. How can you create a dialogue which says this will break? This 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 is going to make all of us collectively poorer. I mean, I think uh, the U.S. political system is in some ways struggling with these questions more than your narrative would allow. I mean, I think. Um, uh, you know, uh, Trump's election, Trump's tariffs, uh, Biden's emphasis on supply chains, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, and all of these policy shifts are, are, are a reflection of a, a set of concerns that um, that the U.S. economy is in some ways a little bit unbalanced. The hard part is finding an effective solution. I mean, in, in the short run, uh, the US is a consumer-driven economy, it's a demand-driven economy, and it's really hard to change that. If you want to get the economy going, and people do want to get the economy going when there's a downturn, sometimes maybe too much, you, you know, you, you need to throw money at the consumer to get a, a, a real impulse. If you want to wait for the export sector to external demand, you're going to wait forever. Um, the sector itself is small. It responds with lags. You won't get the political reward. So, but I do think that there is an, an evolving attempt to try to find 
uh, a bit more balance in the U.S. economy. Um, I think the challenge is finding the policies that effectively support it. And as you noted, the rest of the world has a vote. Um, um, the uh, the U.S. does have to respond, you know, in, unless you resist dollar strength through intervention, which the U.S. has never done. Uh, the dollar's level does have an impact on the U.S. economy. Um, and it works a bit against some of these more political goals for reindustrialization. And that's that's a real challenge, but it's um, it's a hard one because, uh, you know, inflation did get too high and the Fed had to respond and a higher dollar is part of that, uh, the mechanism of self-correction. But I, I do feel like we are struggling as a society to find uh, a better balance inside our own economy, which is why uh, measures, uh, you know, that uh, promote investment in domestic U.S. manufacturing have pretty broad political, they don't have broad political support and then everyone in Congress will vote for them, but they pull well. Um, and I think that 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 is reflected in some ways in our politics. Um, but, you yeah, know, there, there are offsetting factors hmm. and that work against it. Uh, but I, work I, against I, these shifts. Yeah, I, I hear you kind of, um, and, and and why not saying, hey, you know, it's it's really for the to, for the U.S. to to sort out its game. Um, and I'm not so sure about that. I mean, you know, the, the, it comes back to this silly trip and dilemma and and and. Um, Belgian economists and and the like and the exorbitant privilege of you know of the, of the reserve currency and, and again uh, this is the first time we've ever had a reserve currency it just hasn't existed before the dollar really you know I mean sterling was really uh, a currency which was predicated on um, a ratio versus versus gold um, but it and it's this notion of is it endogenous or exogenous um, the You've you've mentioned that Chinese citizens, their the productivity is is, is exceptional vis a vis where it came from. Mm -hmm. uh, in absolute levels, it's not exceptional. Um, China tends to be trading at the margin on the basis of it of being cheap, um, and investment has been a profound lag. Not lie, I can't say, but it's been profoundly disappointing in the United States now. Now, investment, I want to say, is largely driven by again exogenous factors. Um, labor, price of labor, price of labor is the dominant price in an economy, and then prices such as oil. And when you get shocks on the upside, you get a hell of a lot of investment, yeah, and of course. Demand, the expectation of of, of greater so um, demand, and, and you said you know the U.S. is more uh, a demand driven uh, investment, demand driven. Um, should that not be the the global acceptable norm that we should be demand driven? You know, um, so I, I feel like a lot. You know, I feel like the U.S. should be pushing back. I mean, when you like so, and I, I know this. An ill-fated move going on with some some wonderful, I don't know how wonderful they are, but there, there's some politicians in the US trying to pursue an act um, to have a transaction tax uh, on sovereign wealth um, holdings in, in treasuries. Anything to kind of stop this tsunami of liquidity, which destroys the kind of intelligence of money. You know? um, that's one means. Another means is to kind of, and again, it's to kind of, what can we? Why should we accept your all of your flows? You don't accept our flows. Why don't we close our capital account? You know, or why don't you look at models to change your tax system to to create a greater safety net? Why don't you you know pivot towards demand driven growth in domestic China? Why is it in the first quarter of this year that the absolute I don't know if it's the absolute or the investment as a percentage of GDP in the Chinese railroad system is the highest ever. When we know that's that's not wealth creating, so why are we not seeing a, 
a wider debate, if you will, that involves both parties rather than, hey, it's the US, oh my God, everyone has a credit card and shops till they drop? A couple of thoughts. Um, first thought is there are things the US really should do, and I know they're going to be a little controversial to some of your audience, but um, the US tax system fundamentally has discouraged investment in US manufacturing capacity. Um, the best way of seeing that is you know, the massive trade deficit that the US runs in pharmaceuticals. And that's a trade deficit with Ireland and Switzerland and Singapore. It's fundamentally a function of tax avoidance by US companies. And we could change our tax system and start producing the molecules that American companies have developed that they sell to the American consumer at a pretty high price, a big markup. We could produce those here. That is fundamentally a function of tax. There's some other products where the tax system has clearly encouraged offshore production of, of high markup components so that you can book profits outside the US and get a tax rate well below 21. It used to be below 35, now it's below 21, but you still can get a much lower tax rate. That's something we can do on our own that no one, uh, we don't need, in, the rest of the world doesn't have to go along. We, you know, we, Secretary Yellen, to her credit, and I was a huge supporter of this, did try to get a, a increase in the global minimum, and that can help make this politically easier. But fundamentally, we can do this on our own. But there are a set of, of, of adjustments globally, which to your point, would bring a better balance between demand and supply, between savings and investment, in a host of structural surplus countries uh, that that do require changes on the part of other countries. The US, if it acts on its own and other countries don't adjust, will just have a, a, a weakness in our own demand uh, and a weakness in our own economy. There, there needs to be symmetric adjustment. One of like the, the old Keynesian uh, arguments, some of the arguments around the gold standard surplus countries do need to adjust. Before going to the financial transactions task, tax, I would just kind of start by putting a lot more scrutiny of bringing a lot more um, pressure to bear on a, a set, a broader set of countries that in, that has to include, in my view, and it's another controversial opinion, some of our friends like Singapore and Taiwan just sit on their exchange rate, prevent appreciation, have an enormous imbalance between savings and investment. They rely structurally on external demand. They could bring their own economies into better balance. I think China is actually the hardest case because China does support internal demand through this extraordinarily high levels of investment, some of it unproductive, the railway example you gave. But, but by the way, we could do a little bit of productive investment in our own railways uh, as well. We could rebalance a bit there. We could do a lot of more productive investment in our own infrastructure. I mean, my I, I think China overdid it and we've underdone it. Uh, that'd be part of the broader rebalancing. Uh, but but China, in order to be able to rely less on external demand and to rely less on internal investment demand, China has to structurally reconfigure to create its own consumer engine. And you're right, she just hasn't been willing to do that. Um, it's really hard to force that, though, from the outside, particularly in an environment of geostrategic competition. Um, I mean, I thought Secretary Yellen gave a great speech a couple of days ago. It's an interesting speech. Uh, but her framing of, of the challenge posed by China was that she had led, had um, pulled back from the market, which is certainly true. No, no denying it. But it's also a frame that doesn't pull in any of these notions about China needing stronger safety nets, needing less regressive tax, needing less savings to allow domestic uh, consumption to be better in balance with China's productive capacity. So it's just, it shows the complexity of this issue. And actually, I think China, unfortunately, is the hardest case. But look, I, I put forward some more modest version ideas that work in that direction, sort of ways the U.S. could strengthen its surveillance of, uh, of intervention and excessive uh, buildup of reserves looking more closely at uh, hidden reserves, not just trusting countries that, to fully report what they're actually doing in the foreign exchange market. So I would start there. I think there are concrete, realistic things that could be done. The challenge, to be there. honest, is that yeah. it's hard to do those 
in a context of high domestic inflation. Um, yeah. They are consistent with that, uh, making that the immediate priority. Um, yeah, so I, I, the, uh, um, I, I, I view inflation as a monetary phenomenon. <laughs> And, um, it's a monetary and fiscal phenomenon. I mean, we've learned well, that it indeed. takes indeed. It I takes mean, a it, bit of uh, of there, there a supply. Yeah, you get supply. Dis- supply you get supply okay. dislocations, um, but persistency. Inflation is persistent higher rates of price increases. Um, requires a persistent expansion, if you will, in the monetary base or the credit base. Um, and um, I don't see that. So I, I think, uh, I mean, Pat is in 90 days, US inflation is going to be at three and a half percent. And um, I fear for the following year. Um, you, hey, you know, you're good on this reserves stuff. Let, let's talk about the reserves. I mean, I, I, before going there, hypothetically, what happens if the US via you know a, a transaction tax or whatever withholding tax? Um, but if it closed its um its finance account, you know, the, the uh, like like China has. And, and you know, and, and I'm and I'm thinking in terms of you know, we were saying a little bit off camera that you know, in the Ray Dalio world of 75 year kind of pivot points with a variance of 25 years, so Ray's always going to be right. Um, but we're kind of in a drop zone where um, you get a reconfiguration of international standards of, of reserve currencies or the, the governance of sovereign nations and, and how they conduct themselves in, in foreign trade. And and of course, it's it's grabbing the headlines because the protagonists just now are, I would call them the mer- mercantilists, but the countries running these persistent surpluses are saying, oh, we're, we're fed up with these dollars. Um, and actually, I, if there's to be a reckoning, my view is that it would actually be the US rejecting the system. You you mentioned the 1920s, um, and you you mentioned the the pressure it put on the deficit nations. I mean, in the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom came very close um, to a Bolshevik revolution because when you say the pressure is put on domestic prices, the pressure is put on wages. Mm. And that's the strain in America, which creates the stain, if you will, in some of the the more odious components of, of Trump and the like. But so say they they closed, they just said, you know what, reciprocity, you do this, it's working really well for you. You know what, think of this as, you know, we, we're, we're copying you, think of it as a compliment. What would happen to China in that world? Well, there's also a question of what happens to the US in that world, what happens to, you know, the, the, there's a a huge, I mean, we discussed this a bit off camera, like the euro dollar market, the offshore dollar market. It, it In order for it to function, you need access to U.S. domestic dollar liquidity or you're going to have stranded, uh, you're just going to have structural uh, asset liability mismatches abroad that will cause problems. I mean, that's why the, the Fed had to do the swap lines. So I, it would be a fundamental change because the dollar doesn't just circulate inside the US as we know it circulates globally. And if you close the US financial account, all those dollars circulating globally become stranded assets and liabilities. So there's like problem one. So it's profound deflation. Uh, yeah, probably, because there'd be a whole bunch of countries that, uh, of, of, inti- of borrowers around the world that wouldn't be able to access dollars to repay their debts. So that would be uh, a pretty negative shock. I don't, so I don't, it would be really hard to do. Um, and of course, if the U, if financial inflows into the U.S. Uh, co- were brought down because of a, a p- policy choice, uh, the dollar would, would have to adjust, uh, prices would have to adjust. And in the short run, imports would come down faster than exports would go up. So in the short run, it is uh, uh, a negative shock. In the long run, um, I am one of those who thinks that it would be better if the U.S. ran smaller current account deficits and there was more balance in our external trade. And so in the long run, you will get a, a better equilibrium. But the, the difficulty uh, is the uh, the process of adjustment, you know, kind of like technical, economic sounding term. But it, it would be dislocated. I think we discovered this in the summer of uh, 
of 2021, when there was all these supply chain disruptions, which were a function of the fact that our port capacity wasn't big enough to handle the surge of imports that came from, from Asia during work from home. And there were other things going on, but that was a part of that. And so you could think of it as like, you would just see a big upward increase in the price of a lot of, of household goods that in the short run, the US economy cannot produce at home. In the long run, we would probably export more high-tech products. We would still import a lot of consumer goods. We would, you know, the the uh, prices would adjust so that we would be maybe selling pharmaceuticals, be some of these efforts to build up our uh, semiconductor production capacity would yield fruit. We would become a little bit more like Taiwan. And there's a set of adjustments that would have to happen. Uh, and they would happen over time. But, you know, that's probably a five to 10 year process. In the short run, it would be disruptive. It'd be like Brexit, in my view. It would be profound, profoundly deflationary. Um, so let's talk about your... Like, but, but there is a, a, a hopeful path where you can achieve some of those adjustments smoothly over time uh, without this, these, uh, this negative shock. And fundamentally, I, I think we agree that that does require an appreciation of Asian currencies relative to the dollar. Um, without that, you're going to be fighting against price pressures uh, and and economics and finance, and that adjustment does need to happen. I mean, that's that's I mean, you know, raise seventy five years, twenty five year uh, variance. Um, I mean, I, I see it opening up and getting closer and closer because and why do I say that? I, I you, we mentioned. The one, the dollar renminbi rate at, at seven, and it looks like it could slip. Um, I think a greater portent, the Japanese yen. Um, mm. The you've you there's a tremor tra tra is the wrong word to use given their earthquakes and whatever, but um, that's a long data series, and the events of the last eighteen months really bring into question. Um, the, the trend direction in dollar yen and and suggest an environment where the yen could be considerably weaker. So you've got yen potent, I mean it's it's hypothetical speculative to to talk about the, the yen weakness um beyond these levels um and the renminbi weakness. Um and I think the Domestically, the Fed or internationally, Federal Reserve making a, a profound mistake because you, the world that we have today is a world where, because it's not demand driven in the surplus nations, um, growth and because productivity is nothing, because you know, demographics are such, the GDP growth is a rise in debt. And we've we've got elevated historically, we're at four times debt to GDP if we if we take out decimal points, you know. Um, that that requires the persistency of either zero or, or negative real rates. You cannot interfere with the carry. If you interfere with the carry on that, you risk a profound disturbance to the universe. <laughs> and so, and I, and again, I, I, and so I'm seeing the the disturbance. I'm looking at the yen. I'm looking at the renminbi. And then when I think we talked about uh, the euro dollar system. Euro dollar's got nothing to do with like Paris or Frankfurt or London. Is it? It's the non-sovereign uh, creation of dollars uh, beyond um, the regulation and the oversight and everything else of the Federal Reserve. Um, and I believe a lot of it goes on in out of out of Tokyo. Um, and I heard something, and I did. I think I think you'll rightly scoff, but I'm going to take on your, I'm going to I'm going to take on uh, your reaction. But um, there was a presumption: could it have been possible? So we were talking about quantitative easing, first conceived of in Japan yeah. or, or implemented. Um, and I was talking about my misgiving being it's it's rather inert. I, mean, I can't go to Starbucks and buy a coffee with my bank reserves. Um, but imagine if you could pledge your yen bank reserves into the euro dollar system 
and achieve dollar collateral and then go into mainland China and take term and credit risk. That's kind of the conception that I have when I look at dollar yen weakness, yen weakness, um, rather than the widowmaker and the JGBs. To my mind, it's a, you know, the, the, I have no issue with where uh, ten-year JGBs trade. But am, am I just smoking things in the mountains of Utah? Maybe. Um, I, uh, I have some issue with where ten-year JGBs trade. I mean, the the kinkiness of the curve is kind of extreme. So uh, at some point, that probably should be a little smoother. Um, so I, let me start with where I like think you're completely right. And then I'll uh, push back on one point. The place where I think you're right is that the Japanese financial system is actually a, the biggest dollar intermediary in the world. They swap yen for dollars. I think they probably swap it a lot with uh a lot of Chinese entities, the PBOC, Bank of China, some of the big foreign exchange uh, holders in China, just because China has a lot of surplus dollars and it doesn't necessarily always show up cleanly in the U.S. data. So I, I, among the big dollar suppliers globally, I would bet that China's state banks are one. Clearly, one of the big users of dollar liquidity globally are the Japanese banks, both directly to support their dollar lending and their dollar securities books, and indirectly to provide swaps with the lifers who buy hold a really big hedge book. Where I maybe disagree a bit is that in aggregate, the Japanese financial system is swapping yen for dollars and taking uh, credit and duration risk in the U.S. That is such a bigger flow, has been a bigger flow over time than any plausible flow back into China which runs against the direction of the current account surplus, by the way. Um, and so that flow has been huge. That flow did reverse last year. I mean, Japanese entities uh, reduced their foreign holdings of bonds by 200 billion. The Japanese financial systems report, which is a great report, it's a geeky report, I kind of like it, says that the Japanese have sort of, the financial institutions have sort of ended their uh, deleveraging, de-risking um, and the banks in particular have increased their dollar lending loans because they like the floating rate. They don't like the fixed rate right now, uh, but they've done it to the U.S., not to Asia. So that goes a bit against your, your thesis. And then the, the stronger banks, the stronger lifers that have the capital to absorb losses have sold their low yielding treasuries and agencies and bought higher yielding corporate bonds to offset the the, the the cost of the hedge. And that has become a pretty big flow. So like I agree with your basic thesis that we don't understand the importance of Japanese financial intermediaries and a lot of Asian financial intermediaries in the global system. Like the Euro dollar makes you think of Paris um, when it was always more centered out of London. And now it's actually being run through Tokyo. Fully agree on that. Um, but I think it's a it's intermediating surplus dollars into U.S. credit products more than going back into China. There was some of that. There's been some round tripping. Um, I think it's probably more Chinese entities and Japanese entities. Uh, obviously, there was a bunch of dollar bonds sold by the property developers in China that have gone bad. But I, I think the holders of those were some some hedges and then some. Uh, some offshore Chinese more than the my my sense more than the Japanese. I mean, it's a bit like the the old adage about you know the the cost income ratio for for a German bank ensures that whenever there's a bubble somewhere, um, German banks will be overrepresented because the easiest way to control cost income is to expand your top line. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you you know, and and so it's no surprise. Um, well, the. The Japanese, I want to say, kind of disproportionate, certainly led to some of the explosive price reaction back in the late 90s, where they had overcommitted into the Asian tiger economies. Mm -hmm. And via that euro, euro dollar system, you saw five-year senior credit spreads. That was one of the big indications, you know, mm -hmm. where uh, counterparties had to start hedging their risk. And so, and when I think of the amount of, Japanese corporate investment in mainland China, mm -hmm. definitely, you know, you know, China was sexy. China was profoundly sexy. So 
but I, I take it. Let, let, let's, t- um, I'm conscious of your time, I want to talk about reserves, um, the right level of reserves. You know, it used to be, it, you you had to cover, what, three, month in, three months of imports. You had to cover all your short-term, your short-term debt. Um, you'd maybe be looking at a percentage of GDP. Um, I want to say that <laughs> none of that seems to apply anymore. We're we're way beyond any any comprehensible level. But I know you've got a lot of import, a lot, a lot of significant things you can say about that. Look, I think the world right now divides pretty neatly into a set of countries that have way too few reserves. Like Pakistan cannot cover a month of imports. That's way too low. Sri Lanka has no reserves. It's had trouble getting access to the IMF because of the Chinese block that was recently lifted on IMF lending, uh, absent agreement on how to restructure the Chinese bank loans. Egypt, negative net reserves, all borrowed from the Gulf countries. Turkey, negative net reserves. And then there's a bunch of countries that have way more reserves than they plausibly need, according to any of these metrics. Um, You know, Taiwan's reserves to GDP are close to 100. And when countries get that level of reserves, they do a couple of things. Um, First of all, they tend to hide them or move them to a sovereign wealth fund so they don't appear cleanly in the data. And then second, you know, you kind of run them more like an investment portfolio rather than like a straightforward, this is what I'm holding as a true reserve against the need for liquidity, in which case you would basically just hold dollars and euros. I mean, unless you really are doing a lot of trade with Australia or something, you just need dollars and you just need euros. But if you get this huge portfolio, you're going to dabble a bit in Aussie dollar, Canadian dollar, uh, do a few... uh, Maybe put some of your reserves into equities because you're worried about competition with a sovereign wealth fund. So you're going to have a more diverse reserve portfolio just because you actually don't need all the assets that you're holding in your reserves as true reserves. Um, And there's just a number of countries that fall into that category, mostly in Asia. Um, But there's, there's a set of countries that people don't think of as you know, over reserve that really probably have more reserves than not more reserves than they need, but they're they're now well equipped to handle a range of shocks. So India, decent sum of reserves, but it's not not exorbitant. Brazil, decent sum of reserves, again, not exorbitant. And those countries are just in a stronger position than the Turkeys and Egypts and Pakistans of this world. Can you explain your language with with exorbitant and and the motivation to hide is are, are these terms which lend themselves to the suspicion of interferes interferes with the the exchange rate levels with your your trade partners um yes uh, <laughs> i've been uh uh pretty clear about that over time uh, uh the criticism of me is i'm a little too willing to uh, go after currency manipulation and see more of it than exists. But I I don't think there's any question that uh, uh, countries that have large quantities of reserves tend to do a couple of things. They tend to do a bunch of swaps, move them reserves into their domestic financial system so the domestic financial system can take dollar risk. They tend to set up sovereign funds. They tend to encourage their pension funds, their state savings, to invest more abroad, which is what the Koreans have done. And in the Chinese case, when they had a lot of reserves, more reserves than they needed, they encouraged their policy banks, XM, CDB, the the two big banks that have financed the Belt and Road, to to lend to the rest of the world in dollars and, in, in effect, substitute for reserve accumulation. So there, there's just a bunch of things that countries do. And for that, a subset of countries with large current account surpluses, my strong suspicion is that the state's aggregate holdings of foreign exchange tends to significantly exceed their disclosed reserves. And that's sort of obviously the, the case in countries with big sovereign wealth funds like Singapore, some of the, we haven't talked about the dynamics around oil exporters, but the big oil exporters. But I also think that's true for China. Mm-hmm. Can you say, you know, we were talking about 
or I mentioned the uh, the lack of willingness by Benjamin Strong at the New York Fed in the late 1920s, uh, at where they sterilized the gold inflow. Um, now, China has operated its system. What, what do you call it? The the minimum reserve ratio? No, what is it? The minimum lending ratio, where the banks are, you, you have to hold a certain percentage of your reserves with the with the authorities. Required and, reserves. And required, thank you. Required reserves. Um, and and so that exists because there you are, this export powerhouse, and these dollars are flooding into your system, uh, but you're in Beijing and you know, you need red cabbage, which sounds kind of, I shouldn't be saying red cabbage. I don't know why I'm saying red cabbage. You don't, you, you, you can't buy your red cabbage with dollars. You need domestic currency. Mm-hmm. And so the, the central bank steps in and it gives you that. But what you're doing is, it's like the gold, you're putting high powered money. And so you, and then you're looking at the economy. You, know, if we go back pre 2010, the GDP was like 10% per annum. And so you start, sterilizing and pulling back yeah mm-hmm. um, and then we had this great financial crisis and and, and a profound you know this this the the, the un, unbearable lightness if you will of the of the deficit in in demand the the unbearable pressure of the surplus savings you know gdp per capita in the us is 2009 has gone from 100 to 120. It's profoundly, profoundly uh, below where it should be. Um, and GDP growth in China got a little bit hard on that. I, 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 I want to suggest to you that the sterilization of those reserves became less and less. Um, and it resulted in this profoundly overvalued property market, which I want to say is $60 trillion. I want to say is four times GDP. I want to say I've heard higher estimates, but you know, let's settle right run about there. Um, should we be looking... So, And we're saying that reserves are, are massive. I agree with that. Isn't it a question that they're not enough? Talk, talk to me about reserves versus money supply. <laughs> Um, let me let me start by uh, uh, talking a bit about sterilization and what I think happened in China, because um, I, I do think China was a little bit like the New York Fed in the 1920s uh, from 2002 to 2008. Uh, they did sterilize. They suppressed the cost of sterilization by forcing the banks to hold dollars. So they were you, you had to not only hold required reserves in CNY, but you had to hold some of what should have been CNY reserves as dollars if you were a state bank, which is just strange. The loan to deposit ratio, the, at the time, China's banking system was really heavily state managed. So loans to deposits were capped, deposits were growing and loans wouldn't, weren't allowed to go up. And deposit rates were held way below lending rates guaranteed. Like essentially you tax the banks on one side and gave them this juicy margin on the other. But you, the banking system was basically being held back, uh, in my view, from 05 to 08. And then in the crisis, in the face of a huge shock to demand from from the US, from Europe, uh, the Chinese uh, did see their export growth really tumble. So we're facing a really a profound shock to their model. And they just let the banks go crazy. Um, they 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 uh, relaxed the steril they stopped sterilizing. They let the loan to deposit ratio go. They allowed the shadow banks to lend, and shadow banks are just banks without capital, without being subject to the reserve requirement or the loan to deposit uh, ratio. They're unregulated banks. They're not called banks, but they're effectively unregulated banks. And so, yeah, there was this huge wage of leverage inside China that started to absorb domestically a much higher share of China's excess savings. So before the global financial crisis, China was say saving 50% of GDP, investing 40 and exporting 10% of GDP to the world. Well, these are insane numbers. And then after the global financial crisis, savings kind of comes down to 45, investment goes up to close to 45. The current account surplus comes down, but you do have this investment bubble. It's just the world's biggest investment bubble was financed without any inflows from the rest of the world finance out of this domestic savings surplus. And every like property asset, 
kind of thing does become crazily valued. Um, and if you look at China's reserves relative to money supply, they're very low. Absolutely very low. Um, I, I don't think that's the best way to think of them. I think part of it is that reserves are understated consciously because China doesn't want more than three trillion reserves on its balance sheet, uh, in my view. Um, but it's it's also the fact that there was this explosion of credit that wasn't backed by or wasn't offset by an increase in formal reserves. Um, and there is that's the why there's this debate about valuation around the yuan. Uh, you know, China has a controlled financial account, so M2 is not convertible into a hard currency abroad. It just isn't. And China's, you know, they, they have mechanisms of actually enforcing that. These are not theoretical controls. Um, you know, China is an authoritarian society. This is real. The controls are real. Um, and that's why you can have this gap. On the other it, hand, if you look at the trade surplus, the trade measures suggest that the yuan is undervalued. So you're left with this Debate. So, so, sorry, say that again. The, what? Suggests, so, like, if, so if, what you look at M2, if you look at M2 versus reserves, you think like China relaxes the financial controls, money flows out, the yuan goes to eight. That's the theory. Look, like Larry Summers has made that argument pretty uh, prominently recently. Um, on the other hand, if you look at China's goods trade surplus, a trillion dollar surplus, 1% of GDP, that's huge. That should pull the yuan back towards six. So you have these offsetting things uh, uh, by measures that focus on China's external strength, the net long dollar position of the PBOC, the net long dollar position of the state commercial banks, um, the ongoing current account surplus, the low level of external FX debt. Like the government of China has no FX debt to speak of. Yeah. Like, $50 billion versus these huge reserves. So like measures like short-term external debt to reserves suggest China has way more reserves than it needs. Uh, external financing gap, you know, short-term ex maturing external debt plus your current account balance. There's no problem with China's current levels of reserves. But M2 versus reserves, M2 is huge relative to reserves. So if there were to be a wave of, of domestic capital flight, China could not manage that wave of domestic capital flight out of a two to three percent of GDP current account surplus and three trillion in reserves. So the yuan would have to adjust and the current account surplus would have to get bigger with huge consequences for global trade that go against a lot of what we've been discussing. That's yeah, no, to me the debate around <laughs> yuan valuation. And it's a profound one. It's why, you know, why people like you and me can make our living. Uh uh, well, at least why, how I can make my living. I guess you can make your living uh, by trading it. I make my living by uh, helping. God people knows how I make my living. I'm, I'm, I'm in show business now. I mean, I'm, you mm. know, I'm your private dancer. But um, the, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you, know, if if you were to open the the account, um, obviously, you'd you'd have. Well, I mean, you'd really have profound weakness. Yeah, I mean, I think you'd be closer to nine, just given mm. the. Can you imagine if if it we're right in saying sixty trillion dollars of real estate? Imagine what that would buy if you could if you could sell it and put it into an overseas market. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. Um, well, but it, but it's China. A, you can't sell the real estate because the you know in order to sell the price would have to fall, and that would weaken all the banks, and the authorities won't allow it. And then B, you can't transfer it. I mean, it's just stuck in CNY. A CNY is not convertible to a dollar uh, unless you can show a need or you're well connected. Yeah, and again, it kind of it, it looks it, it is probably the thing really weighing on the Hong Kong dollar peg because it you know I, I keep saying I feel like it's a it, you've strapped on a, a catalytic converter from a you know a, a family car onto one of these great monster trucks it's it i mean the a, other thing weighing on the hong kong dollar peg is uh the fed fed rate hikes i mean uh they, they work against hong kong's own economic cycle right now yeah it's an economic i'm uh, sorry it's a it's a pro, it's a property economy mm -hmm. and, and rates and anyway, um, listen. I think I've taken up so much of your time. I could I could spend the same amount of time again, but I I will not. I mean, <laughs> hopefully, we'll be able to entice you back on. But I really, really appreciate the generosity of your time, and I wish you well. And I, I will be following you with great interest uh, on Twitter. Oh.
Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for giving me a platform to uh, expound. And I hope I was clear when I uh, was stating my own theories that I can't fully back uh, with statistics and when I was stating things which are uh, just straight from the data. Now, we've got quite a grown-up audience. I'm, I'm sure they'll make the distinction. So, so thank you. I really enjoy that. There, there you had like you know, prominent, supercharged mind, and um, the issues are they're tough. They're complicated. Uh, they're not without consequence. Um, my interpretation is um, this status quo. I don't think it's helping anyone, but it's the it's the fear of breaking apart that to actually disaggregate this thing, um, you're bringing on hell and fury. That if the US closed its capital account, uh, the change in exchange ratios, I mean, I think, where does the dollar go there? So I guess the argument would be the dollar weakens because you no longer have um, the incentive, the, the prerequisite demand to, to hold the, the, the currency of the dollar. Um, I tell you what changes, interest rates change. Um, you know, my, my argument is the US has become a speculative economy because we've destroyed the role of money. Uh, we destroyed the role of money because you, you dumped Mont Blanc into Lake Geneva. Like, there's just too much. Um, money has lost its wisdom. Well, you're talking about revoking that. You're talking about the, you know, in reverse, Mont Blanc coming out of Lake Geneva and going back. Um, interest rates under that scenario would be be very different. So um, mostly I think you're talking about 10 years, if not longer, on top of the, the 15 years that we've endured since 2007, 2008, which have not been uh, particularly generous to the ordinary folk before this thing could stabilize. Um, would you have inflation? I want to say, I, I hope you'd have inflation because the principal price in an economy is the price of labor. And so you, you'd have higher wage growth. And I think wage growth coming from the level of income disparity I don't think it would necessarily prove to be hyperinflationary or something that would require profound um, economic suppression by a central bank, God forbid. I, I think actually it would be controlled by um, the private sector investing uh, in order to contain that wage growth. And that investment, so wage growth would boost domestic demand. The investment in trying to curtail or contain the wage growth would boost aggregate demand. Profits would explode. Um, but I think you'd get a, a more normalized and a, and a better, more equitous uh, distribution uh, between profits and, and, and labor within the uh, composition of, of uh, GDP. But, you know, difficult. Difficult, meaty matters. So, so as a capitalist, uh, I hope you're wearing your hat. I don't know what my, my hat is. Um, I'm still suffering from this this mountain flu. Um, but you know, I, I hope you're as entertained as I was by by Brad Sterling' uh, performance. We've had Michael Pettis on. Really, if you go back uh, into the annals of time on YouTube and and on the the Apple platform for podcasts, you'll find. Um, an old interview with uh, the legendary Michael Pettis. We've had Matt Klein on, and now we've had Brad. Um, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm trying to find someone that will allow us to, to take a deeper dive into the Hong Kong dollar, the relevance of, of the how it's administered that I want to better understand. I hope you're loving the show. I hope you can uh, reflect that love by telling other people you love it. Um, I hope you buy hats. Um, got a Patreon account, Um yeah, I believe in Ayn Rand, you know, objectivity. Objectively, if you think this product's good, you know, 
to the guy. Anyway, uh, likes, please. The, the more we can enga engage, we, the more we can have the tribe talking about it, the more we can expand the tribe, the more we can get big hitters, and the more we can entertain you. Thank you. Um, until the next time. When I suspect I will not be in the mountains. I will come down from the mountains and I will meet the tribe. God bless. <laughs>